Hello, uh, my name is uh, Alberico Catapano. I'm professor of pharmacology at the University of Milan, Italy, and a coordinator of the guidelines ESC EIS for the dyslipidemia. Welcome to this program entitled Dyslipidemia Challenges, Closing the Gap Between Guidelines and Clinical Practice. Today are joining us in this program two distinguished colleagues, Professor Pepe Zamorano, Head of a Cardiology Service at the Hospital Ramon y Cajal in Madrid, Spain, and Professor Philippe Gabriel Steg, who is a Chief of Cardiology at the Hospital Bichat in Paris, France. Welcome to both of you. Now, let's get started with the program. To set the scene, I will initially provide a very brief overview of the ES ESC guidelines on this epidemia. This will then be placed into context with an overview of the real world evidence by Professor Zamorano Pepe and a case discussion by Gabriel Steg. Now, let's go back to the guidelines. What are the main principles for LDL lowering therapy that came up from uh, the guidelines 2019 on this lipidemia? First of all, the causative role of LDL in uh, uh, cardiovascular ischemic events. The concept that relative risk reduction is proportional to the absolute risk reduction of LDL cholesterol. In other words, one millimole of LDL cholesterol reduction, 22 to 23% reduction of events. This is relative risk reduction, and therefore, the larger the reduction, the better you are off. The concept that low is better, lower is better, yes, indeed, that was accepted in the guidelines. And uh, lowering with LDL, starting azetamide or PCS K9 inhibitors is safe and effective. And uh, therefore, we suggested a goal of below 55 milligram per deciliter, that is 1.4 millimole per liter, in people at very high risk. Indeed, we also suggested to consider even lower goal, one millimole, roughly 40 milligrams per deciliter, in people with recurrent events. And uh, obviously, as a consequence, the intensity of LDL lowering should be based on risk, irrespective of the causes of the risk, either primary or secondary prevention, the presence of diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and you name it. So that slide just depicts for you what has been collected over years and years on research for the causative role of LDL, from the inception of the disease towards the end when you have the acute event. LDL are deemed to be causal there. But this is a key slide that uh, uh, is not that difficult to interpret, although it might look like. Let's take a drug that reduces by two millimoles the cholesterol. And that's because you started with a 50% reduction, let's say, and a person who has a, an LDL cholesterol of four millimole. If the person is a moderate risk, like here, the numbers of events that would be prevented out of 10,000 people treated is 310. However, if you take exactly the same approach, exactly the same LDL cholesterol, but the risk is very high here, about 30, the number of events that will be prevented is exceedingly more than previously, it's 1,440. This number needed to treat here is below 70. This number here is, is below seven, I'm sorry. This is number here is about 30. The same drug, when a person started with 100 milligrams per deciliter of LDL, will have effects that are proportionally lower because there will be only one millimole reduction, and therefore the number needed to treat will be doubled here and here in terms of effects. And this is uh, again with the concept of the guidelines, not only short time intervention, but long time intervention. And the benefit is not only proportional to the reduction, one millimole, you can see here, but also to the length of exposure. These are randomized clinical trials, five years, 22% reduction of events. These are observational studies, average 12 years, 33% reduction of events. And this is Mendelian randomization approaches, 52 years of observation, 53% reduction. To maintain the concept that it's not only a matter of how much, but it's also for how long. And in this line, also the concept that the benefit doesn't come at once. As you start therapy, it takes a bit of time. After the first year of 
of treatment, then you benefit the full reduction of 22 to 23 percent per millimole reduction of LDL. However, in the first year, what you can see here, the benefit is around 10 percent, about the half of the expected benefit for longer treatments. And that also calls for looking with caution to short-term trials where the benefit may look less than expected. And this is the recapitulation of the guidelines. Very high risk, this is the population. The goal is 1.4 millimole, 55 milligram per deciliter. High risk, these are the several population there. The goal is 1.8 millimole, 70 milligram per deciliter. But please note, there is a second goal that is at least a 50% reduction of LDL in this population. Finally, what, how we approach that, this is the diagram of the algorithm that we are suggesting. Starting first, if you don't get to the goal, add a cholesterol absorption inhibitor. If you don't get to the goal, a PCLSK9 inhibitor. This approach is theoretically correct. In practice, we may discuss maybe even uh, a bit too long, and we have maybe cases where we need to take shortcuts. So, Pepe. How are the guidelines implemented uh, at your institute and what are some of the barriers you see in your daily practice? Yeah, this is a great question, Alberico. I think that no doubt that we have the ESC guidelines. We don't have a local guideline in Spain. So we try to apply or we know the uh, ESC guidelines. What are the main barriers? First, I think that especially nowadays with the COVID pandemic, I think that we don't want to wait four, six weeks after um, implementing the high dose statins and check again the LDL. So sometimes we do see that it's much better to directly go to the combination therapy if we are far away from the goal in treating only with high dose statins. Second, we have another potential problem is that doctors, they are afraid of giving high dose statins at press and also patients. They think they will suffer from a severe adverse reactions and they don't want to take high dose statins. So those things I think that we should consider when we analyze the failure of implementing the guideline. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pepe. Now we go to Gabriel. Same question to you on these guidelines and barriers for implementation. Yes, so I, I agree with everything that uh, Pepe mentioned. I would add a couple of issues. Uh, the first one is, uh, I think it's across countries, we see um, strong pushback against lipid-lowering therapy, uh, the so-called statin wars. There's a lot of discussion in the lay press of uh, uh, poorly framed evidence and sometimes uh, anecdotal uh, reports saying that statins can be dangerous, uh, that there are a lot of side effects, that uh, big pharma is pushing statins uh, uh, despite the lack of evidence and so on and so forth. And I think that this negative coverage from the lay press has a real impact. Uh, we have unfortunately seen many patients, including very high risk secondary prevention patients, who have stopped taking lipid lowering therapy. And I, I have to say, I, I find this to be a disaster. And I think that as a profession, we healthcare professionals need to be very, very united in strongly pushing back uh, this kind of nonsense and putting the evidence in front of patients, families, and the public. The second aspect is the uh, lack of adherence because uh, there's beyond the medical inertia and the time it takes to implement the proper uh, uh, treatments, then we need to have patients take the treatment long term. And as we know, there is a, a substantial issue with uh, long term adherence because as soon as patients have cramps or any muscle pain, they will attribute this to uh, statins or lipid lowering therapy. And uh, many times we know it's not, uh, it's not actually a true side effect. It's just uh, anecdotal uh, reports. And uh, so that's, that's also an issue, particularly for preventive therapies where patients cannot see immediately the benefits they derive from this therapy because they don't see the stroke they didn't have last week or the MI they avoided uh, last night. Yes. Thank you both. Thank you both. And I think uh, your comments uh, uh, are, are quite fine, Gabriel, because uh, indeed, indeed, is uh, you have to take the drug for a long time, as I mentioned, to see a very large benefit, and that should be highlighted to the patients. So now let's move from these guidelines to the real-world evidence to see how these guidelines are implemented in practice. Pipet, 
Pepe, it's all over to you. Thank you, Alberico. So if I can show you the first slide here, uh, if we look to the Eurospire and we can see what had happened in the last years, and I will focus now on cholesterol, so you can see that highlighted in red, you can see that to know is not to do. And we have less patients, even less patients according to targets, as you can see in light blue in the slide. This is the last uh, the last registry of the Eurospire 5. You can see that even we have less patients than the registry before in achieving the targets. In the next slide, we can see that even the uh, use of statins seems that we have reached the peak at uh, about 80% in our patients. So not even all the patients are receiving a study. But let us go in the next slide. I will present you what do we have in real world in a more recent study. This is the Da Vinci study. This study is quite nice because it's a EU, uh, EU-wide cross-sectional observation, observational study of a lipid-modifying therapy use in secondary and primary care. And as you can see on the right, you can see in, 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 in dark brown what uh, the targets according to the guidelines in 216, and in light brown, the guidelines in 219. And you can see that the percentage of patients that attaining to the LDL goal to targets was less and less. So in the recent guidelines with the new targets, we have less patients that we achieve the goal, even with all the different treatments, as you can see, with the setimib, with high intensity statin, with moderate or with low intensity statin. So if we look to this slide, which is the real world data from the uh, Da Vinci study, if you see in the right part of the slide, you can see with different colors, the use of low intensity statin, moderate high intensity statin, or a setimib and PCSKNI combination. Then you can see in the low, moderate, high risk, and very high risk, that the use of high intensity statin is quite low, and the combination therapy with the setimib is also quite low. Well, the real bad news is that if you go more to the right of the slide, you will see that not many patients achieve goals. So this means that we are treating not with the optimal dose and the optimal drugs, but also that we are not achieving the goals. Even worse is when we look to the secondary prevention in the very high risk. On that graph, you can see we are pointing that we have less than 40% of patients with high-intensity statin and with a setimib combination, less than 10%, which I think is a drama if we look all right in uh, just uh, uh, how many patients we achieve we achieve targets. So in summary here is we treat not so well as we know we should treat. And even worse, as Napoleon said, even the best strategy failed in the battle camp. So the battle camp is that we are far, far from targets. So finally, in the uh, next slide, we can see that the conclusion of the Da Vinci study is clear, fewer than half of high, very high primary and secondary prevention patients achieved the 216 goals with approximately one-fifth achieving the lower 219 goals. So, Alberico, dear friends, we need to do better. Okay, so what is my summary here, Alberico and Gabriel and dear friends? Well, first, there are two verbs. No, to know is not to do. So we know a lot, but there is a clear gap between the knowledge, the guidelines, and the implementation of the guidelines. So we have the needed tools to implement the guidelines, but now it's your turn. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Pepe, for this overview of uh, a rather sad <laughs> position where we are. Uh, Gabriel, would you like to comment on the use of non-statin lipid lowering or even statin lipid lowering combination therapy and uh, the barriers? Yes, um, so I, I would make a number of comments. First of all, I, we, we must recognize that the uh, uh, decreasing proportion of patients reaching uh, goals uh, in part reflects the uh, more demanding goals that we have set with the, with the guidelines as the evidence has accumulated that lower is better and earlier is better, as you pointed out, uh, to start with. Still, it's impressive that uh, only a minority of patients, a small minority of patients, even at very high risk uh, range, receive high-intensity statin or combination therapies. And then the use of uh, additional lipid-lowering therapy 
is ridiculous. Uh, use of ezetimibe is less than 10%. Use of non-statin lipid-lowering therapy is less than 20% in high-risk or very high-risk categories. So we must do a better job. And I think uh, probably that has to be done by uh, doing shortcuts, as you alluded to in the first place, by starting combination therapy up front, because we know that what is uh, uh, the initial therapy will often stay with the patient longer and that the uh, probability of change beyond the initial step is reduced. So if we start off on a good on a good foot, on a good footing with proper intensive therapies, we have a better chance for the patient. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Gabriel, I, I fully agree with your comments. Uh, obviously, uh, the goals that have been set with the recent guidelines are demanding. Uh, we acknowledge that. Yet, it is important to be uh, demanding because uh, the, the benefit comes with the absolute reduction of LDL. So the more you reduce, the better it is. I also acknowledge the, the point you make about uh, making these shortcuts. And I think uh, we made a, a short uh, interpretation paper to the guidelines uh, in atherosclerosis recently suggesting then when you are far away from the goal, you may consider uh, the association therapy with the zetamide, but just to have a greater chance to get there. And as you maintained, the starting therapy will be most likely the one that the patient will stay when he's out of the hospital. Uh, Pepe, any final comment on this before we move to the case discussion with Gabriel? Well, just briefly, I think only to emphasize that we have the needed tools to implement the guidelines. So I think that we need to recognize that and we need to implement the guidelines. Okay, thank you very much both. Now, for the final part, before we go into the question and answer, we will discuss some clinical cases based on what Gabriel will present and how to bring very high risk primary and secondary prevention patients to the much more stringent target lipid levels early and optimally. Gabriel. So this is, um, I think it's a common uh, situation, a 55 year old patient with hypertension who has never been treated with a statin before and uh, his LDL is measured at 190 milligrams per deciliter, and that patient is uh, seen by a physician as he's being discharged from the hospital on the fourth day after an uncomplicated ST elevation myocardial infarction. So uh, suppose we are writing the discharge prescription, then we have to ask ourselves three questions. Uh, what category of risk is the patient in? What is the target LDL cholesterol we should be striving for? and which should be the LDL lowering therapy we should prescribe. So if we now look at the, uh, the data and the guidelines, uh, it's very clear that this patient is in the very high risk cardiovascular category because that patient has documented recent atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease with a recent MI. And so even that on its own puts that patient in a very high risk category. Uh, we also want to highlight that patients who have diabetes mellitus with or target organ damage or at least three major risk factors or early onset of type 1 diabetes mellitus, patients with severe CKD, patients with a score of 10% or more, and FH patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or with another major risk factor, all of these patients would also be in the same very high risk category. Second question, what would be the target uh, LDL cholesterol for that patient? Well, as you pointed out in this very nice graphic, very high risk patients need to achieve a target LDL cholesterol of 1.4 millimole or less, or 55 milligrams per deciliter or less, and they also should achieve at least 50% reduction from LDL cholesterol at baseline. So how are we going to get there? Well, we know that statins will provide at the high potency and highest doses, such as uh, 80 milligrams of atrovastatin in blue or uh, 20 milligrams of rosuvastatin in orange, they will provide uh, reductions in the range of 50%. So if that patient starts off at 190, we could project that we are going to end up at 80 milligrams. And that would be well above the uh, needed target uh, for that uh, very high risk group, which is uh, 55 milligrams per deciliter. So maybe we should already start off with combination therapy. And we know that if we combine 10 milligrams of ezetimibe with high potency statins, we're going to add close to 20% additional reduction in LDL cholesterol, and that gets us close to the range we're targeting. And so my advice for that patient would probably to be starting with high potency statin at a high dose combined with 10 milligrams of ezetimibe. So let's now think that we are seeing this patient uh, 
one year later with a recurrent MI. And that patient is indeed receiving high potency, high dose statin and azetamibe with 80 milligrams of atorvastatin and 10 milligrams of azetamibe. And as we were hoping, we are almost at goal, 58 milligrams per deciliter, when we know that the goal for very high risk patients is 55 milligrams per deciliter. And my question is, should we change the treatment in that patient? So on one hand, we are close to the level of risk, uh, the, the, the level of LDL cholesterol that we target. But on the other hand, the guidelines have a provision that I think is somewhat overlooked. It's written in small characters at the top, and it highlights that for patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease who experience a second vascular event within two years, then the target should be lower, it should be less than one millimole per liter or 40 milligrams per deciliter. And the patient we're discussing is exactly that in that category. And so we cannot be satisfied with an LDL cholesterol of 58 milligrams per deciliter, and we definitely need to do better. And I think the next step would be to consider adding a PCSK9 inhibitor. Now let's turn to a different case, uh, which in a sense might be a little more difficult. Uh, the case number three is a 68-year-old female patient, and she's being treated for hypertension, and she also has type 2 diabetes. It's been known for five years. She doesn't have target organ damage because there's no evidence of microalbuminuria, retinopathy, or neuropathy. Her fasting LDL cholesterol is calculated at 90 milligrams per deciliter. So that seems like a very, very common type of patient that any of us would see in the primary prevention setting. Now, the first question we have to ask ourselves is what category of risk is she in? And from that category of risk, of course, we will deduce what is our target LDL cholesterol and then decide what should be our LDL lowering treatment. And I think that many physicians would probably not rank the risk properly in that patient. That patient actually turns out to be a high risk patient. If we look at the definition of the guidelines, the guidelines point out that patients who have diabetes mellitus without target organ damage, but either with duration of 10 years or more, or another additional risk factor are in the high risk category. And that patient is exactly there. Diabetes mellitus without target organ damage, but she is also a hypertensive. So by virtue of having these two risk factors, she's already in a high risk population, as she would be if she had a markedly elevated single risk factor, FH without other major risk factor, moderate CKD, or a calculated score between 5 and 10%. So I think we tend to overlook that this combination of risk factors is so potent. We have to remember that risk factors are the risk is actually multiplicative and not additive. So if you have two major risk factors, you're already at a very high risk or high risk. So that high risk patient means that the target LDL cholesterol, as we can see on the next slide, is actually uh, 70 milligrams per deciliter or 1.8 millimoles per liter. And so if we start off uh, with uh, the uh, 90 milligrams per deciliter, then we definitely need to start off with high-intensity statin to get the patient to go. And again, for high-risk patients, just for as for very high-risk patients, it's not sufficient to achieve the target but we also need to achieve 50% reduction from baseline, which is why a low dose of a non-potent statin will not suffice. We will need to start with a high-potency statin, probably at a high dose. Okay, Gabriel, thank you very much for these three cases, uh, actually two, one with the complication, uh, which depict quite well uh, the two extreme. One uh, a patient with a very high risk with recurrent events and the other one with patients that may be overlooked because the complexity of the, the several forms of risk uh, she has. Pepe, would you like to add anything or comment to what uh, Gabriel has just presented in terms of daily practice? Yeah, well, no doubt that uh, those are life and uh, we do see those type of cases, uh, Gabriel. And I think the cases clearly highlight in the first case with a very high extreme high risk, uh, I think that no doubt we should treat very aggressively from the beginning. So if we are far away from the target, we should start with combination therapy, in my opinion, from the beginning, from first day. And in the second, in the second case with the patient with hypertension, I think we should not forget also to treat 
the combination of risk factors really, really go down, go lower with your global risk. Treating global risk is also very important. Yeah. So let's now move uh, to the key takeaway message we want to uh, uh, put forward to uh, the people who follow, uh, the colleagues who followed us today. Uh, Pepe, uh, based on the guidelines for a person at high and very high risk, what would you recommend then or our audience? What would be the takeaway message from what we say today to our colleagues? Well, some key, key messages from my side. First, never forget we should categorize our patients. We should know if the patient is very high or high or moderate risk. Well, don't forget that there are several publications that the perceived risk from the doctor is lower than the calculated risk. So we need to know the categories. Second, we should know the targets. In very high risk patients, LDL lower than 55 milligrams deciliter and not or as in the previous guidelines and 50% reduction. And in the high risk patients, lower than 70 milligrams deciliter and 50% reduction. We have the needed tools. We have the potent drugs to achieve that. Now it's, it's a must to put the patients in target. It's a must to follow and implement the guidelines. Gabriel, any final comment or takeaway you would like uh, to add? Well, um, the first one is um, uh, I would pile on uh, what Pepe just said. I think we need to know the guidelines better. The guidelines provide a wonderful summary of the evidence, and the evidence can be a little complex when we think about the categories of risk. So we have to know the categories of risk probably better than we know them, and we need to really have handy uh, the, uh, the uh, guidelines so that we can refer and properly classify patients. But the I think the most dramatic observation is the dramatic gap uh, between the evidence and practice. And we have to remember that if we are trying to lower LDL cholesterol, it's not solely to make numbers look nice, but every LDL cholesterol that is lowered actually translates into events that are prevented. And these events are dramatic events. They will kill patients and they will leave a, a dramatic sequelae. We have to think only of a patient who has a stroke with substantial sequelae. That patient can end in, in a wheelchair for the rest of his life, despite the fact that this could be prevented by proper LDL cholesterol lowering. So we really need to take seriously this prevention business. It's our duty as physicians to provide proper pr prevention. The evidence is there. The tools are there. We're simply not using them, and it's a shame. Yeah. I would like to add a final point to what you both so uh, well said during this presentation, Pepe and Gabriel, that is, uh, being probably the older among the, the three of us, I still remember in the late 70s when we had available only cholestyramine and clofibrid, and that was it for therapy. Now we have an unprecedented armamentary and new are coming of drugs that will allow us to control very well LDL cholesterol. Let's take advantage of this because LDL cholesterol is a cause of factor for cardiovascular events. Thank you very much to everyone who has been so kind to follow us and now we open the discussion. Welcome to the live discussion and thanks for already posing some questions to our Please feel free to add more. Now, uh, let's start with the first question. Uh, I will address, ask you to address the question one of you first, and then uh, the other can come in. The first is $1 million question, uh, which we touched upon. That is, how can we overcome HCP inertia? Gabriel, uh, we touched that bit, but uh, there may be other nuances there. Yeah. Well, I think the... Uh... I, I see three main reasons uh, for inertia. The first is lack of knowledge of what uh, um, the data shows, which is that lower LDL cholesterol is directly linked to improved outcomes. And this is why having guidelines is really important to educate physicians. The second one is fear of side effects. And um, uh, we need, again, to provide a clear uh, uh, database uh, and review of the evidence to physicians so that they don't overblow uh, 
the uh, side effects from uh, lipid lowering therapies. There are side effects, but they are generally mild, quite rare, and and very rarely severe, particularly with the newer agents. And finally, there's the general reluctance of patients and the broader world uh, related to so-called statin fake news um, uh, that is quite prevalent uh, in the Western world and that we need to counter. So we need to act on broader society by providing and putting uh, in front of everybody of uh, the lay society the evidence. We need to educate physicians regarding the benefits and the safety of lipid lowering agents, and we need to disseminate guidelines. This is why guidelines are so important because not only they summarize the evidence, but they provide it in simple terms for healthcare professionals and broader society. Thank yeah, you. I, yeah. yeah, I fully agree with that. And uh, just to emphasize in a very short that time with the patient is crucial. Uh, no doubt that implementing the guideline is crucial for the benefit of the patient. And we need, we need to treat aggressively and convince the patient that is the best thing that we can do for him or her. I think uh, uh, perhaps we can take one step further, Gabriel, you touched the point of safety, to remind our colleagues that there is no evidence whatsoever that uh, the adverse events, which as you correctly state, those are drugs. There are some adverse events, but they're not linked whatsoever to the level of LDL that are reached on trial. So it means that don't be worried if you go down to 30, 25. It might happen with some approaches, therapeutic approach, but that's not bringing an extra number of side effects. The rate of side effects is the same. You showed that in the Odyssey, but also in the Fourier, it was exactly the same. Would you like to comment on that? Because this is a very important point. This is, a, this is so true. It's quite striking that the evidence base to support the safety of very low LDL cholesterol levels has dramatically increased in the past five years. We now have a host of, of evidence to support the safety of going, of going very low. And indeed, that there's no relationship between uh, some of the side effects, even rare side effects of lipid lowering therapies, and the levels of LDL cholesterol achieved. In fact, some of the side effects are unrelated to LDL cholesterol in the first place. Pepe, would you agree with that? Absolutely. And also, uh, don't forget that the improvement also showed us that in the uh, lower level of LDL achieved by treatment was quite safe. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, with the PCSK9 trials, we had uh, very low levels down to 10 milligrams per deciliter in some instances. However, the, the time length of exposure was limited to two, three years, 3.5 years, while in the improvement, the average was seven years with an LDL below 30. There is a subpopulation study of about 1,000 people who were patients who were there for seven years, nothing happened there, exactly the same uh, take-home messages with uh, the PCSK9 inhibitors. Now, the second question, uh, Pepe, will, you will start first. Uh, the question is uh, uh, kind of picky, and we need to address that carefully. For low-risk patients, low risk, younger than 40, with an LDL between 115 and 190, should we start starting therapy to achieve the goal of less than 115? Yeah, well, this is a very interesting question because in fact, it's, it's too wide. I mean, it's a person that is young, that is with uh, uh, an LDL of 120 or 190, because if 190, immediately, I, you, we need to rule out the presence of familiar uh, dyslipidemia, for example. Another thing is that we may have a young patient but uh, uh, with type 1 diabetes, with evidence of target organ damage and or LDL level above 100. And I think that is a, this is a to be indication for a statin therapy, for example, as long as pregnancy is not being planned. Yeah, But I think that is too wide. So I think that uh, we cannot say with this range of LDL to treat or not to treat. As a general rule, if we have a child or teenager or very young person with low age and, and 120, 130, I will immediately recommend lifestyle modification and check regularly and not treat it immediately. But if we are moving to the other side to 190, 180, immediately rule out other conditions or diabetes immediately, uh, we need to check more carefully and treat this patient. Yeah, 
Philippe? Yeah, I, I concur entirely. I think that uh, uh, 200 milligrams deciliter, even in a low risk patient, is no longer low risk. That actually I, immediately qualifies the patient as high risk and a, a potential FH. So the the scope, the spectrum of LDL cholesterol that is in the question is very very broad. And while a lower risk patients certainly can be managed at least initially with lifestyle modification and changes and only use uh, uh, treat, drug treatment as a second step. For patients in the higher range of LDL cholesterol, I think that it's totally appropriate not only to uh, start uh, drug therapy immediately, but also to screen them for FH, uh, as they may very well have FH, the prevalence of FH in that the population is high. And I think it's also important to recognize that in the general population, this is a very, very large group. So we have to we have to be careful when we dissect out the the guidelines because uh, of course we're focusing on the smaller groups that are at very high risk uh, appropriately because this is where treatment is going to be most beneficial, but it's also important that the broader population brings lower their LDL cholesterol level because this actually will bring lower the cardiovascular risk and the risk of uh, uh, coronary artery disease in the population. It's best achieved with lifestyle changes, uh, but sometimes it requires drug therapy as well when we have the chance of having uh, cheap, effective, and safe treatments as we do for statins and azetimibe, for instance. I fully agree with that. And uh, I mean, uh, life is more difficult with this type of side as compared to the very high risk in terms of what you have to decide for treatment. Here, you have to be a physician, do your job. I mean, the guidelines can give you the general area, but in this case, look at the family, look at the environment, look at the lifestyle of the subject, and then you make a full picture, and then you decide what to do. But in general, lifestyle and diet will be the ones to get implemented. Another <clears throat> question raised by a colleague is uh, what um, lipid lowering therapy would you recommend for a pregnant patient with familial hypercholesterolemia? I suppose the question was, uh, Gabriel. Yes, yeah, so that's uh, that's an interesting question. Um, first, um, patients with FH can be diagnosed early. And if they're diagnosed early in their lifetime, it's not uncommon that uh, female patients will, will become pregnant while being diagnosed. Number two, there is a slight increase in uh, cholesterol levels during pregnancy. So if you start off high during pregnancy, it's going to get worse. Uh, third, fortunately, um, uh, pregnancy is generally safe. Uh, uh, um, and there are, it's rare that you have short-term complications, cardiovascular complications from uh, the cholesterol levels in pregnancy. Okay. Fourth, that being said, unfortunately, we don't have good evidence of safety for uh, many agents in pregnancy. And uh, my uh, tr tr personal reaction is to tend to withhold drug therapy for the time being during pregnancy, because the only class of agents for, we for which we're absolutely sure that they're safe are, are bile sequestering agents, which yes, are effective, yes, are safe, but are uncomfortable for patients and not very, very effective. So I tend to to think that we can live with a few months of hypercholesterolemia and then resume therapy uh, once uh, uh, pregnancy is, is finished. Pepe, will you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes to add uh, that in some cases, extreme severe FH patients that uh, with, uh, let us say, the worst case with a lot of complications, cardiovascular complications, well, LD aphoresis may be considered. Uh, but for sure, I think that what Gabriel said is crucial. And also allow me to add in one second that never forget that in secondary prevention in women, non-pregnant down, same indications and same in goals men. as in men. Uh, just uh, to add uh, an information to our audience, uh, there has been a paper published on pregnant women with uh, unintended treatment during pregnancy because they didn't know were pregnant were, while they were in treatment and those were FH uh, ladies. And uh, the results of this study that has been carried uh, in Netherlands is uh, there is no specific effect on uh, the uh, fetuses 
and uh, to the newborns, everything was fine. And also the growth rate of the newborns was exactly the same and blah, blah, blah. But that doesn't mean we need to treat uh, uh, during pregnancy. It's just to let you know that, that nothing appeared to happen. Now, uh, another question relates to uh, a patient with baseline LDL cholesterol 3.3 following an acute uh, uh, coronary syndrome with statin plus azetamide, but now the LDL is 1.5. Will you recommend addition of PCSK9 inhibitor, Pepe? Yeah, well, I, I think that here, again, we are dealing with a very high risk patient. The possibility of recurrent events is very high, and I think that we should clearly achieve the goal. Uh, if we take out or we don't consider the issue of the money, I'm sure that everybody will agree that the target is crucial in this type of patients. So I think that in this very high risk patient, I will try to achieve the goal with the three steps. So this means combination with the setimib, and if not, then move to the PCSK9 inhibitor. Gabriel. Yeah, the, I agree. The only thing I would add is that this is an interesting question because uh, as we know, um, the uh, addition of PCSK9 treatment to statins with or without ezetimibe to improve cardiovascular outcomes has only been tested in patients who qualified because of an LDL cholesterol above or in the range of 70 milligrams per deciliter or higher. So that if you take patients who are in the range between 55 and 70, there are very few patients like that that were enrolled in the trials. So the evidence we have doesn't really cover that group of patients. There are some patients like that in RDC, and we actually had a paper uh, uh, that just came great. out in JAK and suggesting that uh, they probably derive benefit, particularly if their LPLA is above median which is above 14. Uh, but uh, I think we're getting now into the more exploratory aspects of the discussion. Yeah. Overall, I think that it's good to keep a simple message. If you are very high risk, such as post-ACTS, and you're above 55, uh, we need to get you to go. Yeah. A similar observation came from the Fourier was presented at this meeting and was published as a letter in circulation yesterday or something. So again, uh, it appears as if the benefit con is consistent with what we all know, in, in other words. Now, the last question, we have two minutes left, so uh, let's be sharp here. And uh, uh, the question is, what is the optimal time interval for monitoring LDR cholesterol? Does it depend on the type of drugs? Gabriel. Well, um, I tend to... Uh, um change treatment and then give a few weeks for treatment to, to act. Um, we know that for uh, uh, statins, it's, uh, it's a reasonable, for oral treatment, it's a reasonable assumption. Uh, actually, LDL cholesterol goes down pretty quickly. Uh, the fun part is for PCSK9 inhibitors, because as they're given discontinuously, there can be substantial differences depending on whether you do the monitoring just before the next injection or uh, a few days after an injection. And so I think it's appropriate to look at what's happening uh, uh, before the next injection rather than just after yeah. you gave therapy. Well, uh, here is very, very short. I will say that is one of the few discrepancies that we are doing with the guidelines. So in the guidelines state, if you have an acute coronary syndrome, you need to recheck for six weeks after uh, giving the, the high-dose potent statin. We don't do that. So we immediately start with the combination therapy if we do see that with statin alone, we will not achieve the target. So now, mainly with the COVID uh, situation, we don't recheck after four, six weeks after an acute coronary syndrome. Mm, um, nothing else to add uh, in what Gabriel said, only this minor thing. Okay. I think it's fair enough what has been said, but if with oral drugs a uh, uh, month, uh, you have achieved 99% of the reduction, maximum theoretical reduction, so it should be okay. For PCSK9, what uh, Gabriel suggests is, is very important. It should be before the next injection, not just a few days after the injection, because that may change the patterns there. So we have almost finished with our time. We have 15 seconds, which we will take to thank you, Gabriel and Jose, for participating in this discussion. Thank all the participants who posed a lot of questions. We were able only to answer a few of them.
and uh, hope you have learned something from our discussion this evening. Thank you very much again for joining us.